So this will be not the, uh, I don't know, master class. It would be more like a lecture with a lot of uh, different facts, different things about something that will like uh, compile into like a pretty clear thought about how to do the realistic animation better. So the, the, the name of this lecture uh, is uh, Realistic Full Body and Facial Animation Analysis Through Human Psychology and Brain's Visual Perception. It's a pretty boring thing. So here we are, funny, funny pictures. We have eyes, we have brain, we have consciousness, and we have something around us, like the games, paired action, movies, cinematics, VR, AR, quick time events, keyframe, real time, digital doubles, gameplay, everything. Uh, there are lots of different things that surrounding us. And uh, some of them are pretty realistic, like, like, like a lifelike. Some, some is, I don't know, uh, stylized, definitely looking not real, real, but something like a cartoony or whatever. Uh, and we're looking at these things around us with our eyes and like something happening inside our brain and we're having a vision of what we're looking at. So basically I will talk about uh, how different the things that actually exist, uh, things that, uh, I don't know, coming through our eyes to, to somewhere and the things that is like we're seeing. So it's completely different things. So Sparrowsoft is a pretty big studio. There are lots of different big projects with uh, highly detailed characters, with the uh, mocap animation, with the complex keyframe animation, including the Mortal Kombat. And right now, even the mobile games are pretty detailed in terms of the quality of the models, textures, shading, lighting, all that stuff. Uh, they're pretty close to reality in terms of the visual presentation. And I want to talk about why we're seeing something and feeling not good about what we're seeing, even if the, there are like, like a very detailed everything, but still the perception is like not good. So we have eyes, we have brain, and we have two funny words, pareidolia and apophenia. Both words sounds pretty much like, I don't know, something from psychiatry, like some disease. And actually it is. Both of these words are was uh, like a psychic diseases, but for now they are just the explanation of how the brain works. So let me dive deeper inside the first word, pareidolia. Pareidolia is the tendency for perception to impose, impose a meaningful interpretation of a nebulous visual stimulus, so that one sees an object pattern or meaning where in fact there is none. Uh, common examples are perceived image, images of animals, faces, or objects in cloud formations or lunar, lunar pareidolia, like the man in the moon, on the moon rabbit, blah, blah, blah. You can see the picture from on the right side where you can see the, the rabbit, the face, the, I don't know, the uh, human being silhouette or whatever. Uh, the concept of pareidolia might extend to include hidden messages in recorded music played in rivers or at higher or, or lower than normal speeds and hearing voices mainly in district uh, or I don't know maybe music in random noise such as that produced by air conditioner or fans actually it is <laughs> I have an air conditioner right now and I have some district voices somewhere so Peridalia was at one time and considered as a symptom of psychosis, but it is now seen as a normal human tendency. Uh, there are a bunch of words. I don't exactly understand all of them, but I, I'll try to explain like in these simpler words. Uh, so basically, pareidolia is the ability for our brain to 
create something that is not in the actual picture. For example, uh, if we're seeing some person that partially covered by, I don't know, leaves, for example, yeah, or something, uh, we can create the parts of the face of the character or the person that is not seen at, at this moment because of the pareidolia. And because of the pareidolia, we have an art as, as in general, because we can uh, recognize something without lots of details, like the just the hand drawing of the human face. We will recognize this as a human face, even if there are not, not too much details. So apophenia is something different, but quite similar. Uh, really sorry. Please bear with me. Hello. That doesn't mean you can. Спасибо. So sorry. So apophenia is the tendency to perceive meaningful connections between unrelated things. The term apophenia was coined by psychiatrist Klaus Conrad. He defined it as, it is as an unmotivated scene of connections accompanied by a specific feeling of abnormal meaningfulness. Uh, he described the early stages of delusional thought as a self-referential over interpretations of actual ten sensory perceptions. Apophenia has come to imply a human propensity to seek patterns in a random information such as gambling or whatever. So basically, Apophenia is quite different, but it's more or less the same. Uh, so, apophenia, uh, I can describe it like you have a bunch of different facts, completely different, like the images, visual, uh, behavior, I don't know, lighting, audio, something, and somewhere behind your, your brain, these completely different unrelated something unrelated facts unrelated uh, things uh compiling the i don't know suggestion about something like uh, just imagine you're watching movie you're seeing a pretty dark corridor uh you can see a white wall with the menacing um, shadow with the with the knife and the uh, tension in the music and there are some silence pause whatever and with all these facts that like separately means nothing you creating as i don't know a suggestion you creating a meaning of what you're seeing you're seeing i don't know a maniac in the mansion for example yeah the, the same goes to i don't know to movies to cinema to TV to games, whatever you're creating the image uh, that consists consists not just visual something, but more than that, uh, right? Uh, because of apophenia, you can read the emotions of the characters of the persons because of only because of that. Uh, like like the mouth corners going up, this is a smile and all that stuff. So here we go, the pareidolia and the apophenia, like, like you can see the faces everywhere. So the, they are not actual faces, but they are. See not only the faces, but something different. Okay, uh, so pareidolia and apophenia. What we have here, we have a different images of the same a human face with the different uh, level of details. Like on the right, we have just the circle, two dots and the line. And still we can read this as, as a human face. This is the pareidolia and apophenia in action. So if we're going to the left on this, on this scale, uh, we have a more readable face with more readable emotion with more readable uh, readable facial expression but it's still very simple uh, with a lot of details lacking there are there are no details still no details here in the middle we have a pretty detailed uh, face with a 
easy, easily readable emotion with the easily readable, I don't know, uh, idea behind this this head, like, like the raised eyebrow, all that stuff, the smirk. So you can read it, you you can uh, understand what was behind this image. Uh, here we have almost, almost realistic image of the of the same person, of the same character, with a lots of details, with the shadows, with the uh, small lines, with everything, but it's still not realistic. It's still stylized. So it doesn't feel like bad or unnatural. It's just a dragon, but 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 very detailed. And on the left, on the on the left, we have the just the photo of the same character of the same person. So yeah, and there's a very famous term called uncanny valley. Uh, do you know what it is? Probably you know what it is. Yeah, uh, but anyways, uh, this is from from the uh, Wikipedia. But anyways, uh, the and oh sorry, the uncanny valley concept was identified by the robotics professor Mas Masahiro Mori as Bukumi no Tani Gashiro in Japanese, I don't know what, it, what this means, in 1970s. Um, Mori's original hypothesis states that as the appearance of a robot is made more human, uh, uh, some observer's emotional response to the robot becomes increasingly positive and empathetic uh, until it reaches a point beyond which the response quickly becomes strong revulsion. However, as the robot's appearance continues to become less distinguishable uh, from a human being, the emotional response becomes positive once again and approaches to human to human empathy levels. This area of repul repulsive re response aroused by a robot with appearance and motion between a partly human and a fully human. Uh, really sorry. The that's just true. Really, really sorry. That. Sorry, this is the sick <laughs> consequences of working from home. Uh, Okay. Uh, however, at the robot's appearance continues to become less distin distinguishable from a human being, the emotional response becomes positive once again and approaches human to human empathy levels. This e area of repulsive uh, response aroused by a robot with appearance and motion between a partly human and fully human, uh, like almost human and completely human in every aspect, entity is the uncanny valley. The name captures the idea that an almost human looking robot seems overly strange, menacing, uncomfortable to some human beings, produces a feeling of unc uncanniness and thus files to evoke the impact, imp impression and uh, good response. Examples of the uncanny valley can be found in robotics, lifelike dolls, virtual reality, augmented reality, computer animation, movies, cinema, uh, TV, whatever. Everywhere where you're seeing the almost realistic something, I don't know, human-like robot, uh, the character from the game that looks almost like a human, but not like 100%. This is the graph for the Uncanny Valley. Uh, let me explain what it is. Like horizontal line is the human likeness, the, the amount, uh, how how close to the human this thing is, like m less similar or more similar or completely identical to, to the real human. Uh, the vertical is the affinity, I don't know, the appeal of the character. Is it like, uh, creating the positive emotions or it's creating the completely negative emotions. So basically on the left, we have something that doesn't look as human at all, completely not human. 
and on the right we have like a 100 identical to a human person something i don't know robot character uh, creature whatever uh the this line is the line for the steel images for the steel something this line is the line for for the let's say moving something like the, for the moving robot for the doll with the puppeteer i don't know character from the game or maybe creature from the movie so as you can see the more is human like the character or object is uh, the more appeal it it happening when the viewer seeing this but at some point there is a very deep dive down like the character becomes more and more realistic looking more and more uh, human like but the appearance but the appeal is uh, just falling down and you can feel that, that this is not like the very good detailed character but it's something more like a zombie or a corpse so like at, at the peak before the, uh, we're ge getting to the 100 realism we have a stuffed animal because this is just the uh, actual animal even if it's that and it looks completely 100 uh, percent like real and because it's not moving, it's like it's here on the highest level of the appearance. In stuffed animals, there are some inconsistencies. There are, I don't know, uh, glass eyes, uh, something wrong with, with the pose, poses, something wrong with, uh, I don't know, four or whatever. So it's not like 100% real realistic or, or like completely real we have a humanoid robot i mean the robot that looks like like a human person like two legs two arms head eyes maybe maybe mouth something like this but when we're approaching to the 100 percent realism we're get in troubles like the character that looks almost in identical to the real person but having some noticeable flaws even if the, these flaws are very subtle i don't know eye movement or maybe facial expressions or maybe the way how the character moves or the person moves like with some strange jerks or whatever the the appearance goes down very, very deep. And we have feel that we're looking at the corpse if we're looking at the still image, for example, like, because the corpse is the, the human being that that is dead, that is not alive. And when the care, when the person dies, uh, lots of muscles getting relaxed and the facial expression, the pose uh, is completely different to the to the living person to, to the person who's alive and we can spot these small things like like not by not with any purpose not because we want to but because the, how the, how the brain works here we have my electric hunt it, this is uh, the prosthetics but with some kind of uh, mechanics uh, so the prosthetic hand uh, that, that can move this feels like more and more natural, but still it feels bad because this is not a real, not a real thing, but this thing is pretending to be real. Uh, dolls are the good examples. Like here we have the Yas uh, Toko mask here. This is the pretty realistic masks from Japan uh, with uh, lots of details, with uh, lots of everything uh, pretty accurate in terms of the anatomy uh, but the Yase Asoko mask uh, they're picturing the uh, suffering so any Yase Asoko mask is like something uh, of someone in pain because of that 
it's below the like the normal reaction for you know, for viewing this image. Uh, the Akina mask, on the other hand, is pretty much the same as the Yaza Toka mask, but it portrays the happiness, like like the good positive emotions. And because of that, uh, it's like more positive, more um, higher on the on the scale. Banraku puppet is more or less the same, but uh, there are like pu puppeteers who's moving this uh, this puppet. Uh, the puppeteers are like on the black cloth, so they're almost invisible. Uh, pretty, I'm pretty sure you, you saw this. Here we have like ill person, like like the 100% realistic looking person with everything is intact, but this person is definitely ill and you can spot these small details like like you can spot uh, the people with some i don't know uh, heart attack or whatever you definitely spotting this you're definitely noticing that something goes wrong with this with this person not because he's yelling or showing some some signs that i'm i'm sick but because his uh, behavior is quite different from the normal person so yeah and at the, at the very top and right, you have the healthy person. Everything's fine. The look is good. The uh, the character looks absolutely realistic. He's he moves in a proper way. He behaves in a proper way. So that's the uncanny valley. This thing was described for the humanoid robots. But this uncanny valley theory applies to everything, to character animation, to look deaf, to, I don't know, human characters, uh, robots, monsters, aliens, whatever. If you have something that looks almost exactly like the original something, but not almost, not 100% real, and especially if there are like, more most of the things are on pair like very very realistic but you have small things that uh, falling down i don't know uh, some flaws with the animation with the mocap some flaws with the you know, shading lighting uh, these small things ruin completely the the overall look of the character and the feel of the character the appeal of the character not because the, the everything was wrong, everything was, I don't know, bad, but because of small things telling your brain that this is not real, this is something uh, not right. So, so here are the same faces, uh, the same things, uh, pareidolia and apophenia, but uh, there are added two areas on the right is like ungrounded area and on the left is uncanny valley area so basically if you're creating your character with very few details without any details like this drawing uh, with just two dots line in the circle this character is ungrounded it it applies not only for for the art for, for the driving but for the animation for the acting whatever uh, so you don't have enough details to tell the story of this character because you're always telling the story with your animation with your modeling textures whatever everything works for the story if you're i don't know creating a scar on the face you're telling the story if you animating some kind of smirk, you're telling the story. Uh, you're posing your character in a certain way, you're telling the story, always. So lack of details means ungrounded. You don't have connection between the, your character and the viewer because uh, the viewer don't read all what you want to say. Uh, when, oh, sorry again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, when we're going to the left, to the more and more and more realistic character, for, we're adding the details, we're telling the story, and with every iteration, the, the telling story process is easier and easier because you have more 
things to tell. You have more tools to tell the story. And here we have pretty stylized face. And here the, there's addition, the, this menacing, ugly looking face right in the Uncanny Valley region. And actually, this face is more detailed than this face, but it looks worse because of the Uncanny Valley, because it, it, it have too much details that telling your brain what it is. And there are some areas where these details is, are, uh, I don't know, wrong, broken. And because of that, you, you, you don't have any feelings, like positive feelings for this character. So basically, uh, for the design, for the art, for the animation, you need to ground your character or your you know, prop, asset, environment on this line. And you need to decide where you go in, from where you go, in, and how you will tell your story. Like here, at the middle of this line, of the scale, we have pretty stylized character with pretty much of details. Like we have lots of details on this on this drawing. Lots of lots of details. But because there is no like signs for the brain that this is the real person, the brain doesn't send in alarm signals that, that this is something wrong. Because this is pretty much stylized, obviously stylized. Here are different styles of you know, characters. On the right side, we have like just the double, yeah, circles, lines, lack of emotion, lack, lack of connection with the character. There, there are some, ex some cases where a pretty genius you know, artist can create something absolutely amazing with like two lines or three lines, but this is something very rare. Uh, here we have a pretty stylized character without like proper, uh, proper anatomy, without proper proportions, with a lot of, I don't know, stylizing everything with the, uh, with the very few details, but still this character is pretty appealing and we can read the emotion, the silhouette, the poster, all that stuff. Here is like, like, here is like a, oh shit, like a, in the middle between this very stylized and absolutely real, we have this drawing. Here, right before the Uncanny Valley, we have pretty detailed character with a lot of details. The hair, the clothing, the cloth simulation, the shading, the lighting, all that stuff. But this character is moving like a stylized character. Like, like there are things that matches the, the way how the character moves and the way how the character looks. Like, there are not different from each other. The character is pretty detailed, but not realistic. The animation is pretty detailed, but definitely not realistic, not, not the mocap. And here we have the Tom Hanks from the uh, Midnight, uh, Midnight Express, uh, I suppose. Uh, he looks pretty stylized. He's not 100% realistic. He's definitely stylized because of the lighting, because of the uh, textures, because of the lack of some details. But he moves like a real person, like because of the motion capture, because of the way how this motion capture was captured cleaned up and retargeted. And at least for me, the, the watching this movie was like at first like torture because I saw the dead people on screen. But after I don't know 15 minutes or so, my brain gets adapted to this you know, style. And I have pretty much fun watching this, but still uh, there was definitely uncanny valley effect. Like you can read that the, the, there are huge amount of work on, on this movie. The details on the characters, the models, the detailization of everything, the, the hair, the cloth, the visual effects are top-notch. But the overall feel is not so good. 
because of the uncanny valley. Here is the ideal example of the uncanny valley. The, this is the Superman, the Henry Cavill, and if you know the story for the for the Superman movie, uh, there was a reshoot, and the Henry Cavill already been signed for another movie, and he have mustaches, and he was unable to shave off the mustache because of the lowers, uh, whatever. So what they did, they created the CG face and removed the mustache uh, digitally. Uh, I used to work on the studio that did this like uh, years before, and I know the story from, from the first hand. So basically what they did, they created the lower part of the face, like completely CG, CGI, the lower part of the face. The, the chin, the mouth, the no nose, all that stuff. And they replaced the real face with the CGI face. And even if they used the thousands of photos of the actor, they used 3D scans, they used pretty complex rigging, they used pretty complex texturing, shading, lighting, all that stuff. Even if you're looking at the still image, you can spot the problem you can spot that something something is wrong you can't like like put the uh, put, put the finger point the finger and say this is wrong because of that no you just seen that something wrong you, you just noticing that this is like uncomfortable uncomfortable to look at and this is not because the artists were not too good and not experienced enough this is because of the uncanny valley because the quality of the final image is so high that the overall appeal is going down but the quality is very high the quality is almost like like lifelike so uncanny valley effect is in general not this is what happening when you did your job poorly no Uncanny Valley is the psychological reaction of human brain to a specific set of specific different factors that like overall. Uh, very often Uncanny Valley effect occurs only on some small parts of the her of, of the character appearance. Uh, facial expressions, some flaws with the facial animation, textures, I don't know, quality of the textures or the way how they apply, shading, lighting, body mechanics, balance, timing, all that stuff, very small problems causing a lot of problems for the character in general. And kind of all effect in a small area always heavily affects the perception of the whole character and the whole animation. It's literally a fly in the ointment, literally, like small, small something makes big, big something looks bad. Not because this big, big something is bad, but because this small something is bad. And here we are, the black box between eyes and brain. So basically, what we're seeing is not what our eyes seeing. So, uh, what is the black box between the eyes and the brain? It's a set of visual, emotional, and behavioral patterns and templates that affects human perception. Uh, perception. Uh, what I'm calling the behavioral behavioral patterns and templates, and I'm. It's like, I don't know, data set inside your mind. How do people look? How do specific people, specific person looks? How they walk, how they run, how they sit, how they smile. Uh, uh, this is a, an enormous supercomputer that does God knows what and outputs something mysterious to somewhere. This, this black box doing the automatic anal analysis comparison of actual images from, from the eyes with the visual patterns and templates recorded in the subcortex. 
in real time, you you can't control it. You can't stop it. It's always on. It's always uncontrollable. Estimation and interpretation of the various results that affects the perception of the actual images. I, I mean, this is the pareidolia and uh, all that stuff. So basically, if you don't see something, this black box will create something that will fill the gap. Even if it's not like the, the, the real gap, if you don't see some details on the face, on the character, uh, your brain, your, your black box will create the lacking details and you will have not the image you're seeing actually, but the image uh, that was recreated after the going through that black box. In fact, this is a giant organic neural network uh, and network's owner trains it throughout his whole life. And basically, uh, just imagine, like I'm living in the west, in the western country in Russia. We don't have uh, Afro-American people here, like around us. We don't have them. We can, we have movies, we have TV, and that's all. If you're seeing the Afro-American person like on the street this is something like very interesting and because of that i, I don't have this uh, neural network trained to recognize this this uh, race this entity and because of that it's hard for me to to I mean, spot the difference between two different people like they are completely different for sure but because i don't have this this data to analyze to analyze this to to make a you know weighted decision that this is the uh, one guy this is the other guy i'm struggling with this and this happening all the time not not only with the characters but with everything so uh, if you're looking at the i don't know people all the time you have a lot of information on how the uh, p human beings behave how they move how they look how they stand how they sit and because of that it's very hard to fool you and trick you and show something like a computer generated and make you believe that this is not something computers computer made but this is the character and it's alive Another thing about the black box, how to catch a ball. It's a pretty simple thing. Yeah, some someone throwing the ball and you're catching the ball. What happening when you're catching the ball? It's not that easy, actually. There are lots of, of everything, lots of calculations, lots of everything happening before you're catching the ball. So uh, what happening? Object tracking. Basically, you have two eyes, you have two different cameras from slightly different perspective, and this black box computes the trajectory of moving of the object, for example, of a ball. And you have like you're right now at the at the exact at this moment, but actually you have like a, a line to the past and line to the future, and you have like the positions of the object in time and you can create the trajectory to the future based on the positions of the object in past so that happening inside your brain and because of that you can estimate the trajectory of the of the you know, flying ball but but this is not all uh, because Besides of that, uh, what happening else? Uh, the determination of mass, size, and physical properties of the object uh, based on visual information, visual recognition. Uh, in other words, like you're seeing the ball, you you have your data set trained for balls because you have like your happy childhood childhood and you played a ball a lot like I don't, know, I don't know baseball whatever and you know how the ball looks and you can recognize this so you're recognizing this is the ball and you know the 
rough mass, rough size, rough physical properties, how how the ball bounces of, of the of, of the wall, I don't know, of the of the wood wall, of the of the floor, whatever. You have this information. And when you're tracking the object, when you're creating the estimation, the, the trajectory to the future, you need to keep in mind these properties that not in, in the actual image, like this mass, size, physical properties, even more. Uh, you can easily, easily spot the center of mass judging by just by the silhouette. Yeah, when you're animating, you're always placing the center of mass where the contacts are so your character is balanced. This is happening because of the black box inside your inside your brain. So taking into account various in, implicit factors that are absent in the image, such as gravity, inertia, physical properties of the environment and the objects, uh, calculation of the trajectories based on this inflate implicit factors are slightly adjust, getting adjusted. And then comparison, comparison of the trajectories predictions that were made using visual and behavioral templates inside your mind with the results of direct calculations. So basically you have the trajectory of the ball from past to the future uh, that was calculated using the object tracking, using the, uh, the determination of mass, uh, all that stuff. And you have your patterns, visual patterns, your predictions uh, that happening because you have a whole life throwing the ball. You know how the ball flies when it's like spinning. You can make uh, like a weighted decision that the ball will fly to the by the curve because of the way of the of how the ball was thrown the same uh, for the character animation the same object tracking tracking the same pre uh, predictive trajectories based on actual information from ice but in that case, we're tracking not the ball, but the I don't know, hand, elbow, eyes, direction of the uh, line of sight, all that stuff. It's pure mathematics. Like, like you can create, uh, calculate the same using the, the computer. It, it would take a lot of time and inside your brain, this happening like in, re in real time. Uh, you can say for sure where the person looking at at any moment if you're seeing his eyes because of these calculations you can spot the uh, the way how the eyes is crossed or they're not crossed so you can spot the exact point of interest for this character because of these calculations so determination of mass size and physical properties of an object based on visual information absolutely the same we can see i don't know tall guy fat guy small guy and we can have this information just looking at this image and this information of mass size you know center of mass like like he has like a pretty heavy backpack and because of that the center of mass is, is slightly shifted so we're having this information because of of, of our eyes and we're using this information for calculation and taking into account various implicit uh, factors that are absent in the image such as such as gravity inertia physical properties of the environment and the objects calculation of the trajectories and because we're spending whole life surrounded by the human beings we have a pretty big massive data set of the people anatomy, people behavior, the emotions, all that stuff that is like, like you can write a thousand of books about this, but you can't because this is hidden inside your mind. And then the, the com comparison of predictions 
made using visual behavioral patterns and patterns with the results of direct calculations. So basically, you have a picture of the, I don't know, ninja who moves on, on a very specific way, like inside your mind, because you watched a thousand of movies about the ninjas, because you are ninja, because you read a book about ninja, all that stuff, because you saw pictures of ninja. And when you're looking at this character and on screen when you're playing the game or when you're watching the movie you have two different ninjas one ninja is like, like the actual ninja that you're seeing using your eyes and the other one is the ninja inside your mind and you're comparing this and if they're not much you have like the signal this is not ninja this is clown and if this two if these two images matches but like not completely like he moves like ninja he looks like ninja but there are some strange you know twitches on the arm that not like human completely at all and in that case happen in the uncanny valley because something gets wrong with this character with the way how this character moves and all that stuff so i already explained it but but the human vision is visual analysis defining object properties using the actual images uh, that come into our mind through eyes behavior and motion calculations based uh, based on visual analysis, behavior and motion predictions based on visual patterns and templates inside our mind, comparison of predictions and calculations, uh, making adjustments based on com comparison, uh, sending analysis and recommendations to the mind. So how the black box signals to the, to the mind, to the brain, the closer the result in the representation is to be stored in a black box template. What I'm, what I told before about ninjas and patterns. Uh, the more difficult is to convince the brain that this representation and template are identical. The more patterns match, the stronger and louder the alarm will sound if the remaining remaining patterns are slightly different like we have 99 percent matching like our picture of the ninja and the actual ninja like 99 percent 99 percent matches but one percent is completely wrong and that's why it is so difficult to create a believable digital double of a famous person or well-known historical historical figure or a, an actor like the superman the henry henry cavill actually the the technical stuff was absolutely amazing it was it wasn't like 100 percent real 100 percent identical to the uh, actual actor's face and because of that this uncanny valley happens if the set of templates and patterns for specific case is limited then it's easier to trick the brain. That's why various monsters, creatures, characters with obvious visual queerness, I don't know, elves, dwarves, orcs, aliens, people with rare ethnics, uh, whatever, that kind of characters, absolutely lo looking absolutely better, more real than the CG representations of well-known characters or races or objects because we don't have data set to match the image inside our head inside our head and the actual image from eyes so what is uncanny valley this is the tiny discrepancy between the whole image from eyes and the black box representation based on set of visual patterns and templates. Anatomical discrepancies, uh, body or face mechanics discrepancies, when the character 
looks like a human or looks like a something that it represented, but it behaves slightly different than it should be. Conflict between visual appearance and motion. For example, fully realistic human character that moves as a robot or as a cartoon character. This is like completely different things, like a realistic uh, creature or realistic human and the way how it moves. Or vice versa, highly stylized cartoony character with mocap applied. This happening like in, in a lots of different projects in, in I don't know, in game development, in, in movies, in TV, and it happens and it looks bad because the the way how the character moves and the way how the character looks doesn't match. Even more, if we're talking about the mocap, if we have like a pretty big musk, muscle character, I don't know, orc or just the big, 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 big man, but the actor, the motion capture actor is like just a slim, small person. Uh, when you're applying this kind of motion capture to the character that doesn't match the appearance, the proportions, the size, the, the mass, uh, you will have the same uncanny valley effect. It's like, I don't know, when the when the big fat man moves like a 10 years old girl, like doesn't matches. And even more, uh, some, something happens, uh, it's, uh, the conflict between the environment and the characters. Like you have completely real characters and uh, even the uh, in, in movies, like, like just the real actors that was shot on the green screen. And you have a pretty romantic, uh, very stylized environment. and these two things doesn't match us at all. And because of that, you can you you, you can't feel like you, there is no appeal in that in that in that case. So when the uncanny valley happens, when the black box gives an, an ambitious verdict, this is a ball, like something thrown at you, and you're recognizing this. This is a ball, or this is not a ball. It's something different. This is sugar. This is not sugar because it's not sweet. Uh, in that case, uncanny valley effect does not happen at all. It's okay. Uh, uncanny valley effect starts when black box can't unambiguously determine what was what it was seeing. Look like the realistic person but it does not move like a real person there are some strange jerks and twerks so in that case the uncanny valley, valley happening this is this substance substance is a kind of sweet and looks like a sugar but there are some strange chemical taste that the uncanny valley in fact the uncanny valley effect is something similar to I don't know, vomiting, the, the reaction of, of the uh, organism when the body tries to get rid of suspicious substances that seems to be like, like the normal food, for example, but at the same time, uh, it feels questionab questionably suspicious. Like you're vomiting when you're, you know, drink or eat something that was tasty at first, but then something happened inside inside your stomach and something happened and something inside your your body made a decision that this substance substance is dangerous and we need to get rid of this. Same happening with the uncanny valley effect when you're looking at something that looks like something but not quite matches. It's almost almost the same, almost perfectly matches, but there are small uh, small things here and there, and the smaller these uh, inconsistencies, the the louder the alarm sounds. So when discrepancy between predictions and the actual calculations is noticeably higher higher than the certain threshold but still remains uh, within the okay zone the brain sends a signal like this is not a rubber ball this is heavy steel ball painted to look like 
it make made of rubber yeah like something throwing uh, someone throwing something to you you're recognizing this object as a ball you're recognizing this as a, a rubber ball but it flies not like a rubber ball it flies like something heavy and you can judge this by the using your black box your data set of, of everything so one discrepancy between the predictions and actual calculations is below this threshold. Uh, brain sends the signal. This is a rubber ball, definitely. It's a rubber ball for sure. But maybe it's a little bit he heavier than it seems, and it was heavily wasted during the throw. So basically, this is something that is much as the criteria that was written inside your head. But it behaves slightly different. But this slightly different is inside the uh, inside the range, and then it's not on, on the threshold line. And when one part of the predictions fluctuates near the threshold zone, and the other part jumps far beyond the critical zone. Uh, for example, when the ball looks like a real ball, but its trajectory is ignoring the laws of physics uh, i don't know zigzagging or character face looks real but facial expressions seems anatomically impossible like the smile happening but the cheek cheekbone zone does move doesn't move at all for example in that case brain cannot decide where to attribute what it saw it looks like a ball, but it, the, the trajectory is definitely wrong, definitely not real, and all that stuff. In that case, black box sends out the alarm signals, and here we go, and Kanye Valley. So let me show you the helicopter. Oops. Did you have the uh, uncanny valley effect when you watched this helicopter that, that defines the uh, rules of the real world physics? Probably yes. Uh, this is happening because you have a picture of the of the helicopter inside your inside inside your mind. You know exactly how this helicopter should fly. And when you're seeing that kind of maneuvering, uh, the acrobatics, it feels unnatural and feels wrong. But to me, because uh, I have a hobby, I'm piloting this that kind of remote controlled helicopters. I have a data set slightly different to other persons because I'm I'm looking at that kind of videos. I'm piloting the real helicopter, the real model helicopters uh, in that way. And because of that, this looks to me completely OK, completely real. But for, for the people who just saw this kind of movements, it feels very unnatural, very, very, very wrong. The same happening with the character animation, the same happening with the look depth. Uh, you have a data set and you have something that you're comparing with your data set. Like you're looking at the elf. And you know how the elves are looking exactly because you watch the Lord of the Rings, you read a lot of books, you read the comic books, whatever, and you have another picture and you're comparing what you're seeing and what you're having. So. This is another another uncanny valley. This is the one of the first uh, movie created on Earth was in 18th century, I, I suppose, or or at the at the end of the 19th century. I don't remember quite exactly the date, but this was the first movie that was shown to audience and the people in the uh, from the audience was 
shocked. They had uncanny valley effect because they saw the train and they thought that this train is freaking real and it's about to crush everyone and kill everyone. Lots of people find it at the first screening of this because they, they didn't have the data set about movies that this is just the white white fabric on the wall and this is just the light that creating the images and this is not the real things here is another example of like uncanny valley like the after the the meme uh, creating the 100% realistic feel that, that this uh, ball is not like the, the two grams. It's something heavy. It's like mounted on something invisible. And it feels like very unnatural, very strange, very, I don't know. And this is the goal for this uh, pantomime to show something that doesn't exist, uh, to fool you, to trick you. Here another example of the break dancers who dancing like robots. They look exactly like robots. They they doesn't look like a real persons because they move in a completely broken way. The real beings, uh, human beings, doesn't move like that because the human body is the bunch of pendulums and they are moving with the arcs always everything moves with the arcs and they doing this for purpose they want to to, to show that they are not humans they are pretending to to be robots by moving on a certain way so where does uncanny valley come from and how to fight it so this is starting to be more interesting. So there are certain critical zones when you need to pay very close attention. Like there are certain areas where it's pretty easy to, to do something that will break the, the field, break the appeal for the whole animation. First of all, that it's anatomically incorrect facial expressions. If we're talking about the animation, even game animation, cinematics, whatever. Uh, when you're looking at person, when you're looking at person in general, you're pointing your attention always to the face, always to the hands, to the palms, to the fingers, and maybe sometimes to the, to the shoulders, to the clavicles, because you're conversating with the people, conversating with the uh, opponents, and you're doing this by using your head, using your face, using your arms and palms, you're gesturing. And because of that, you're always making, paying attention to these areas of the, of, I don't know, of the character. So basically, th this is not something you can control. The, the gamer, uh, the, the viewer will always look at the head, face, arms, palms, fingers, and clavicles because of the way it works. And if you have something wrong, something broken, something not finished, something not polished enough in these areas, arms, palms, face, clavicles, uh, even if the rest is freaking amazing, you will have the uncanny valley effect because you're, you're not think what you should do at the areas that critical. So next one is incorrect eyes movement. This is the pain for everyone because the eyes moves in a so freaking complex way. There are lots of micro, micro movements, uh, eye darts, uh, some kind of phrases, uh, fixation on the points of in interest and changing these points of interest with this specific rhythm. If you don't have this, if your lack of mic micro movements, if, if your lack of eye darts, if the eyes are just focused on one in one point, 
for, for the certain amount of time. If you're lacking the fixation on points of attention, if you're like if, if the character not changing the point of attention, even if the character looking at the uh, other character's face, like uh, their one on one conversation, uh, the real person no never looks at the sm same spot for for the for the long period period of time you're always looking at the eyebrow at the chin at the nose at the eyes it's always movement and if you don't have this in your animation especially if you're animating something like a cinematic or close up uh, you will ruin your animation even if the rest of the animation is quite cool quite good quite polished so hands, fingers, wrists, very important. Important. Even if you're animating animating something like a small character, like like very small, tiny character on screen, still you need to pay attention to hands, fingers, and wrists because we're reading the character by reading the silhouette, and it's definitely different when you have like like a shovel or you have a natural looking uh, finger poles. It's reading very easily. So contacts, fingertips, moving grip, points of contact, it's very important. Even more, it's uh, very obvious to see that, uh, that there is uh, there is something wrong with the animation with the character. When the character, I know, holding the gun or holding the weapon or sword or whatever uh, the grip is very important the finger pose the way how the object in the hand moves while the character moving its head hand because the grip is not static like lots of animators doing that trick just constraining the i don't know sword to the to the palm and that's all and then they, they're just bending the fingers and breaking the uh, the wrist this looks completely off i know this is wrong because the the way how the object in the hand moves while the character moving this object is very important and you reading this when you're looking at the animation and you're seeing something wrong it's not like 100 percent when uh, cases when you when you can point that this is the problem this is the problem this is the problem with the wrist but actually this is not the problem with the wrist this is the problem with the grip so you need to fix the grip and by fixing the grip you will fix the wrist uh, joints in general shoulders elbows knees all that joints is very important uh, when you're working with the mocap uh, you have pretty natural moving of these joints i mean the the way how they bend but if you're doing a keyframe animation you have more freedom you can rotate the elbow in all three axes and it will ruin the the animation ruin the perception of animation because black box will tell the the brain that something wrong with the elbow the elbow is broken because the real elbow can't rotate on all three axes because we have like a very limited amount of of freedom to move the to to bend the elbow same goes to the clavicle uh, the this joint is very limited. I, I can't bend this uh, my uh, my arm higher without breaking my clavicle. Yeah, if I need to, to lift my arm higher, I need to use my clavicle and rise my shoulder. And this is very important. Uh, you can't. The, 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 this happens like inside this black box. Your your black box will point at these broken parts that doesn't seem to be broken like like obviously it it broken in some certain way uh next is spine the spine is very important too especially if you're working with the mocap uh, 
it's very very common thing when the spine is very rigid because of the mocha because of the way how it was recorded or the way how it was uh, cleaned up or the way how it was retargeted to the character uh, there are lots of cases when the spine from the pelvis to the to the head is like almost everywhere almost always the just a straight line this doesn't happen at all in the real world the spine is something flexible especially at the lower part we have the chest that is rigid rigid yes but but the part between the chest and the pelvis is is very flexible and if you can't hide this problem you need to fix this problem and the other part is the ideal arcs of body parts like the uh, ideal lines that are drawn ideally there is no exactly straight lines in the real world there is no exact exactly ideal arcs in the real world uh, we have our body made of bunch of pendulums so when you're moving your arm the arc for the wrist will will consist arcs for the elbows arc for the shoulder arc, arc for the cl uh, clavicle arc for the pelvis arc for the uh, for the chest and all that weight shifts balance poses uh, everything will reflect to the arc of the of the palm and because of that this arc will not be like the ideal it will be more or less an even in terms of timing in terms of spacing in terms of the of the way how the how the, how the specific body part moves so you need to keep in mind this when you're keyframing you need to keep in mind this when you're working with the mocap too because when you're uh, trying to get rid of some issues with the mocap data like the broken broken animation or i don't know sliding feet or whatever that happened before you you need to keep in mind that you need to keep the uh, the right feel of the arcs because because of the black box uh, the brain will have the information that something goes wrong if the brain will see that the arm moves not in a natural way perfect strike trajectories this is the other side of the coin uh, there is no perfect stride lines when the uh, object is moving on the stride lines because of the body made of pendulums even if i'm trying to move my arm like on the straight line it's not straight at all because of the all my joints because all of the natural things <clears throat> so because of that, uh, animated, animating in IK is something that you need to keep in mind that even if you're animating in IK, the arms, the feet, whatever, or contacts, you need to create the arcs, not ideal, but arcs, not straight lines. If you are, if you just animating uh, post here, post here, and you have a straight line, it will break the appeal of the of the whole animation. Uh, two noisy curves. This is something that might happen with the mocha when the cleaning is not too good. Uh, if you have like a cleaned up lower body and have upper body that reacts to different movements of the lower body that happening uh, lack of natural micro movements tremors natural irregularities in general this is definitely goes to the mocap because when you're working with the mocap data you're filtering the animation you're reducing the amount of keys you're reducing the amount of detail on your key on your curves and while you're fighting with the technical issues caused by the uh, mocap hard hardware you can kill the small details small natural details because of the over filtering 
So basically, it's a very subtle thing uh, when you need to understand what is technic te I don't know, technical noise of the of the curve and what is something essential, essential, something that needs to be there. For example, if you're just cl cleaning up some some jitter on the on the wrist you were losing the natural movement of the wrist with the uh, technical problems. So basically you're curing something and you're killing something at the same time. And you need to, to keep the balance of filtering and the keeping the information inside the curves. Lack of mass and inertia, broken balance, broken relaxed po postures. This is just the basic stuff, but it really matters you can read the pose you can read the balance of the of the silhouette of the character you can spot the exact point where the center of mass is looking just looking on the silhouette because of your black box and if your character i don't know jumping and spinning while flying and he this object is spinning not around the point of uh, center of mass you will notice it. Viewer will notice it. Even more, viewer will will be unable to tell what's wrong with this animation because it's too complex, too too tricky to point exact uh, the problem to, to exact problem. But it will have the same uncanny valley effect on the animation, and the whole animation will will look worse. Balance, same same thing. Uh, the lack of balance is a very common thing when you're uh, retargeting uh, mocap data data from the I don't know from the actor that is subtle, small, thin to the character that is uh, pretty big, massive with the long arms. I don't know for like for the chimp or for the monkey with the different proportions of the body parts. In that case, when you're doing the retargeting, you're adding corrections, you're adding some, uh, fix, you're fixing some uh, intersections and all that stuff. In in some cases, this might case must might case the broken balance because of the shifted, I don't know, silhouette or whatever. Uh, speaking about the camera. Uh, there are uncanny valley for the camera movement too, actually. So basically, camera in paired action sequences or quick time uh, events or in cinematics is another character. And the way how the camera moves is very important to have the proper feel of the uh, acting for the characters. Even for for the Mortal Kombat, if you're working on the camera, it, this is very important. Not just to show the whole image, the the whole character, the whole uh, figure on screen, but to show it properly. So when the viewer or player has no control over the camera, the chances for the uncanny valley to happen is are greatly increasing like when the uh, prior action sequence starts or when the quick time even starts uh, the ga the gamer loses the ability to control the camera but yeah the camera is moving by something else and if it movement it, it, its movement is broken or unrealistic you're having uncanny valley effect not just on the camera movement but for the whole image for the whole scene in general camera instead of following following the action predicts it and moves in sync with the action or even outstrips it this is the common problem for the camera animation like uh, camera is something that is uh, just looking at, at events it's not predicting the, the events. It's not like knowing exactly where the character will move in this in the, in the next second. It's always following the action. So if the character suddenly moves to the left, the camera tries to catch this move like a bit later. 
So basically, camera is always offset to the character's movement. And this is very important. It's a small subtle thing that uh, may greatly increase the appeal of your animation. Because if you, your camera is moving in sync with the movements, uh, with the character's movements, like, uh, I don't know, one character kicks another character on in the gut and the character just flies to the left, if the camera starts to move to the left to keep the flying character on screen at the same time when the actual kick happens, uh, you're ruining the feel of the real movement, real motion, real uh, emotion. You're making this animation to look fake because the camera can't predict the movements of the characters that, that it's shooting. But if you add small offset for the camera movement, it will greatly increase the appeal for the animation. Uh, the camera is glued to the character, especially while character is actively movement, moving. This is another very common mistake when you're just, I don't know, constraining the camera to the characters, I don't know, to the part of the body of the character, or to the pelvis or to the mind control, whatever. So you, you're making your life a bit easier because the character moves, the camera moves with the character, but actually it ruins the whole animation because the actual camera can't be uh, connected to the character. Uh, in some cases in, in cinema, they're creating the rigs, the physical rigs that put the camera in front of, of the character face on the rig that connected to the chest. Uh, this is special effect uh, with the special meaning, with the special uh, feeling of, of this. But if you're just connecting the camera to the body part and just moving with, with, the, with the character in sync, it looks way, way too bad. So basically, as I said before, camera is the another character. So the trajectory for the camera is something unique. It's not related to the uh, character's movements. It, it's more or less related because the, ca because the camera is like following the action, showing the action. But the trajectories, the timing, the, sp the speed of movement, of movement for, the, for the camera is not synced with the uh, movements of the characters. And another one is the camera movement does not follow the natural way of filming. Uh, what I mean in natural way of filming, when you're shooting with the real camera, you're almost static. You're not moving much to the sides or whatever. You're rotating the camera. So if you keep this in mind and you need to you, you need to show that, that the camera is moving from one from, from point one to point two. Uh, you need to keep this like more or less natural because uh, again, data set inside our heads for everyone who looks, uh, who watching the movies, who watching the uh, gameplay videos. Uh, we have a picture of how camera should move in the real world, in the in the I don't know, in the in the uh, game whatever if it doesn't match it feels uh, unnatural and uncanny and the lack of mass and, and inertia on camera is very important if you're working on the cinematics where you're fooling the audience when you're tricking the audience that the audience is watching some kind of, of a movie not just the part of the game, but the movie, like the Hideo Kojima's games, uh, they are very cinematic. And camera movement in that games in the cinematics are top notch. The camera moves exactly how the actual camera, the real camera, would move if the if the director will shoot the same movie. And this is very important. It, it's add, it adds value if you're adding this more or less realistic details, even if it's something stylized in general. Uncanny body mechanics, the same thing. Uh, the parasitic uh, movements that are impossible impossible with the real person, like it completely breaks the appearance. If, 
If you see that the character moves not like a real person, if it looks like a real person, uh, you have uh, too big of, of a contrast between the appearance and the and the movement, and you're like it's constantly clicking and hearing the alarm. Inconsistency between animation and characters' proportions uh, that I already been spoke about, uh, talked about about it. Uh, proportions, dimensions of the characters. You need to always match the the way how the character moves and the way how the character looks in terms of the uh, silhouette, in terms of the size of the mask. The the good good example is the I don't know historical movies uh, where the actors fighting with the plastic swords. Plastic swords doesn't weigh this much as the real metal swords, and because of that, you can easily easily spot that this sword is fake because it doesn't have mass, it doesn't have inertia. Same happening with the with the character animation. You can easily spot if. The, the size and mass doesn't match us with the uh, with the animation. Lack of balance uh, because we're always reading the silhouette because we're always reading the center of mass. If you're lacking uh, the balance in your animation, it will be noticeable for everyone, even for non animators. Uh, Mocap cleaning artifacts. Uh, I talked about the before the shaking freezes, broken arcs, sliding feet, broken contacts, uh, way too filtered curves without uh, vital details inside the inside the curves. Uh, for keyframe animation artifacts, uh, is uh, two perfect movements, uh, ideal arcs, ideal spacing, ideal timing. It breaks the the feel. It breaks the appeal. Unless you have like pretty stylized characters that should move in a in a certain way with the perfect movements, perfect darks, and all that stuff. For example, when I worked on the Aquaman movie, we did a bunch of animation for the digital doubles, for the fighting, for the swimming, and we always did the first passes with the let's say perfect movements with the clean arcs, clean spacing, clean timings. And then we did another pass to add dirt into the spacing, timing arcs, just because we, we did the digital doubles that should look like a real people and the real people doesn't like move with the perfect everything. So, this is the illustration of what I'm saying about the details inside the curves. This is basically the same too much of, of every, too, too much of everything and you need to clean like with a good amount of thought what you need to clean and what you need to keep inside these uh, curves and then lots of keys. So let's Let's look at the, at the pictures. Here we have pretty fancy guy with the pretty fancy sweater and the broken shoulders, completely broken shoulders. So broken silhouette is the very important thing. This might cause the uncanny valley effect, even if it's not realistic animation at all. If you have broken silhouette in terms of the, uh, I don't know, shoulders position, the feet position, the head position, that might cause by the uh, retargeting of mocap data or just not too good keyframe animation, you will have the uh, uncanny valley effect. Speaking about the face, we will have the uncanny valley effect that will ruin the appeal of the character animation. If we have anatomically incorrect behavior of the facial muscles under the character's skin, even if you don't have, have actual muscles inside the, inside the character, inside the rig, uh, there are actually muscles that, like fake muscles, let's say. So basically, when the real person, real person uh, moving the, uh, I don't know, lip corner up, 
actually at least three different muscles working and it's not just moving the uh, the corner up there are lots of things happening between the eyes and the mouth and if you're not showing this if you're you know if a rig is not uh, advanced enough to show this uh, facial deformation uh, you will have the uh, uncanny valley effect even if the overall animation is quite cool quite good broken lip sync and and, and and natural emotions another thing uh, the broken lip sync is uh, like when you're hearing the audio you're matching this audio with the with the way how the mouth and the face move in and if they're not matching it feels very uncanny Sp same thing goes to emotions uh, if the style is let's say stylized uh, you can do like completely crazy emotions with the without any limits but if you have something more or less natural looking you need to keep the uh, range of emotions uh, inside some kind of uh, sphere of realism because if you're breaking this sphere you're losing the appeal because the character doesn't look appealing doesn't look correct in incorrect way it looks broken same mock-up cleaning artifacts with the face absolutely the same the jitter freezes broken arcs over filtering uh, keyframe animations too perfect if you have stylized character you're okay with the perfect movements perfect arcs and everything if you have realistic looking character or if you have like some parts with the mocap you need to match this like eyes very important the the movement of eyes the the focusing on the points of interest the eye darts is very important they're pretty easy to move to do the eye darts and they're adding a value and if you're losing this value you're losing much more that you actually lost lost so let me talk about facts a bit facial action coding system this is the anatomically correct representation of the facial facial muscles and this is the face rig for the game character and actually all these controls are representing the facial muscles what facts do facts do it actually emulates the the way how the facial muscle muscle structure works with the all the skin sliding all the folds all the deformations of the face and because of that uh, fox rigs doesn't have just one control for the mouth corners because there are three oh, sorry there are actually three different muscles that controls the mouth corner and the same goes to other parts of the face so basically if you're animating with the fox rig you need to understand how the actual face in anatomical way works in real world and if you are knowing what you're doing you will have like pretty realistic results with this kind of rigs so facial action coding system facts uh, the facts manual is over 500 pages long and provides detailed description of action units and descriptors Using facts is possible to manually code nearly any anatomically correct facial expression, deconstructing it into the specific action units and their temporal segments that produce the expression. That why the facts system is used in rigging, because with this 500 long uh, manual, you can code every emotion you have. Like, in game rigs, in movie rigs, uh, the fax system is pretty simplified. It's not like a 500 pages with uh, tens of different uh, action units on every page. It's something like 35 action units or 50 or 60 units. Uh, but the, the, the math is there, the way how the emotions and the 
face movements is coded into these uh, action units is pretty useful for rigging. And because of that, most of the hyper realistic rigs, facial rigs, are fat hacks. So, uncanny cinematics. There are two different screenshots from the same game. Everybody knows this game. But to me, the, the right guy, the blue guy, looks way better than the left guy. Uh, why? Because the left guy is 100% human, looking like a human, even if by story he's a humanoid, android, whatever, but he looks like a human. He has a proper uh, skin tone, uh, the hair, all that stuff. But the right one doesn't have this like signs that I am a real person, look at me. He looks like a like like a human. He looks like a humanoid, uh, but he have different skin tone. Uh, he have strange details on on his face. He has different eyes, and because of that, your black box doesn't alarm him that this doll is not a human. So basically, the quality of of everything for these two different characters are more or less the same. The details, the texture quality, the shading quality, everything. But the appeal is bigger for this guy because it, he doesn't look like a real person and because he doesn't have the, that uncanny valley effect. And even more, if you look at these two characters in motion, you will notice that this character, even if it's, it's one of the main characters, looks worse compared to this. And this feel is because of, of the uncanny valley effect, because this character looks more or more like a human. Proportions, clothing, uh, skin, uh, everything. And this one looks more like a robot, more like a non-human something. And all the artifacts of the motion capture, all the jitter, all the tremors and all that stuff actually working to appeal more to this character because uh, all these artifacts add in value to this character. Uh, this is famous screenshots from the famous game Mass Effect 3. I picked this uh, these screenshots because we have pretty awesome designs of the aliens that looks awesome in every way, even in terms of movement and all that stuff. And we have pretty blunt looking human characters that looks that doesn't look like a human. And I'm not talking about the uh, issues with the facial animation and all that stuff that uh, everyone loved. Uh, I'm talking about the overall look. And this happens because of the same uncanny valley effect, because we know exactly how the humans look. And all the problems, all the issues, having the very loud alarm sound. But we don't know what this creature is because this is alien. It doesn't exist in the real world. And because of that, this creature looks much, much better because it doesn't have this uncanny valley effect. And actually, the amount of detail on everything, the models, textures, shading is pretty comparable with all these characters on on these uh, screenshots. It's just the way how we're uh, feeling about these characters. And because we don't have any background for this character and for this character for, uh, as, I don't know, ethnics, we don't know what it is. It's an, an alien. Aliens might look like anything. And because of that, it appeals more compared to the human characters. Uh, the Avatar, the absolutely genius movie by genius director. And I don't think so that the blue skin tone was the just the artistic choice. I'm pretty sure that, that the blue, sky, blue skin was chosen not because it looks cool, looks nice, looks fine, but because it, it like the, making the characters 
distant from the real beings, real humans. Uh, the proportions is different uh, for for this uh, for this aliens. The the skin tone is different. It's everything to separate the humans, the real humans, and the the aliens, the characters from this movie. And they're still human-like. They're still humanoids. They're still very appealing because of the shape of the face, because of the mouth, because of the eyes. So, but there is no any uncanny valley effect at all. And here we have a lots of uncanny valley effect. This is the uh, Tintin movie, as far as I remember. Uh, lots of everything looks wrong to me. This is the Bia Wolf movie, the CG movie, uh, because we have like a shirtless character with the lots of muscles, with the uh, six pack, with everything, but without proper muscle simulation. It looks like a doll completely. But in both movies, we had pretty awesome char <clears throat> character. This captain and this king looks absolutely amazing because of the bird, because of the hairing on, on their faces. And this bird's beards, they are hiding a lot of signs that this is fake. Like these parts of the of the faces, the cheekbones, the lower jaw, the chin area deformates. Uh, there are lots of deformation because of the the way how the uh, jaw moves, because of the way how the skin slides over the flesh. And if you can't show the proper way of deformation of these areas, you need to hide this. By I don't know by hair by I don't know uh, makeup or whatever. This is the Final Fantasy, the first one uh, that was created something like a 20 years ago. It was a breakthrough. It was like the very very ambitious, uh, absolutely stunning movie in every meaning. But most of the characters was so dull like so unnatural because of the of the lack of the quality for the motion capture at that stage because of the amount of work needed and the probably tight deadlines but one character this one the scientist with the again with the facial hair uh, looked so brilliant so natural so real I was pretty amazed. And again, uh, lots of critical areas hide hidden by the by the facial hair, by the uh, design of the clothing and other stuff. This is absolute gem. The Hellblade looks fantastic. And take a look, the, the face covered with the lines, with the contrast lines, with the heavy makeup, blood splatter, whatever. And this is not just because it looks cool. This 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 was made because that that contrast makeup, that strange lines trick your brain and uh, distract your black box from the small issues on the face. It hides the the not so not 100% realistic uh, skin deformation, the jaw deformation, and all that stuff. But it keeps the feel that this is very stylized, uh, designed for purpose uh, look for the character, and it created it made beautifully. So here we have two characters. One of them is like CG generated. The other one is the real person, the real actor. And I'm pretty sure you can easily, easily spot which one is the CG generated. The one on the right, definitely. So this is the illustration of what, uh, why this is so difficult to create the uh, digital double of the well-known character or, or well-known uh, person. 
because there are so many small, tiny, almost invisible details that jump in right into your eye and your eye starts bleeding because of that small details. Amount of work was absolutely incredible. I mean, the, for, for the creating the, the CG double. Very detailed, everything. Lots of work happened, but still doesn't look quite real. So this is uncanny everything. The Christmas Carol movie with Jim Carrey. All the characters look creepy in a bad way, not because of the design, but because of the uncanny valley. And again, after some time when you're uh, pushing you yourself to watch this movie, something clicks and you're starting to realize that your this creepiness is, is doesn't bother you anymore. So basically this is the when your data set is getting bigger and you're having different perception for, for the same images. Well, this is pretty realistic uh, head made in the meta human in the in the Unreal Engine, and this is the same head with the weird lover body. <laughs> so this looks pretty cool, pretty amazing, actually. It's not. 100% realistic, but it looks cool. But the same head with the same everything on this uh, bad looking body ruins everything. And this body looks bad, not because of the uh, of the textures or the details on the on the geometry, but because of the broken shoulders and the broken elbows. This is the same head with the uh, robot body, and this one looks quite better because the we didn't see the robots in our real life, so we don't have like much, much more a uh, clear picture of the robot body to compare with. So basically, we're seeing and believing because we don't have much data to compare with, and this is the same head with the I don't know samurai body and this is pretty good because the armor have a rigid part on the chest on the forearms on the pelvis that hides all the issues with the animation all the issues with the with the retargeting when the shoulders are too high or too low when the posture is not 100% realistic. This is one of the ways on how to not to show the problems you have with something. Like you need to hide the problems. So how to fight the Uncanny Valley? The, the highest quality, 100% realistic animation, taking into the account of all of the millions of the nuances of the realistic movement, uh, the highest, highest, highest quality, 100% realistic visualization that takes into account all the millions of visual nuances. This is the uh, something unrealistic. You can't do this because you don't have uh, so much time and so much resources to do 100% everything. So how to fight Uncanny Valley in loop dev in real life? First of all, you need to, to learn how to hide the problematic areas. Less is better than too much because of pareidolia. So basically, if you're hiding something, like you, you're uh, reducing the details on the textures, like meaningfully, artistically reducing it, uh, the black box will add the missing details on the appropriate parts of the, I don't know, of the clothing or on the skin, like the all the folds. You don't need to create an, uh, all the 100% folds that the, the real person have. You, you need to, to create mind folds and trick the brain of the viewer that the, the other folds are there. So cloth simulation can help to hide the imperfect animation. I'm 
you say imperfect. Uh, I'm, I mean that the uh, animation that lacks the, I don't know, desired quality, that is not 100% realistic. For example, if you have like the cloth on the upper body, you will hide the all these small details that happen in on the joints, on the arms, on, on the forearms, because the arm moving inside the clothing, inside the inside this things so basically this is the good way to to mimic this uh, the other one is the physically correct cloth fabric hair simulation because because of the black box the your brain exact knows exactly how the hair is behaving how it moves how it waves on on the wind or whatever or underwater and if you don't have the close results to the real world or to the rules of the game for the specific set of, I don't know, for the, the action happening on the moon or in the space, whatever, uh, you will have the uncanny valley effect. Skin slide and muscle simulation is very important if you show in the character without uh, clothing, I, I don't know, shirtless warrior or uh, don't have uh, skin slide and muscle simulation it will look like a plastic doll even if you have absolutely amazing textures and shading and lighting it still will look like a plastic doll because of the uncanny valley because when the character moves uh, there is no proper deformation in the skin skin sliding on the appropriate parts of the body uh, you can use the short hair instead of the long hair if it if it's possible by the art direction if not then suffer mustache birds uh, masks and glasses will help to hide the problem areas on the face and as as i said before if you were always looking at the face because it's the way to communicate with the opponent. So the Tintin movie, the Beowulf movie, the Final Fantasy movies, you can look at them and you will find that the characters with with glasses, with I don't know, hats, with something that covers parts of the face looks better because of the pareidolia, because something that you don't see you will reconstruct inside your mind if the brain believes that this is something real contrasting bright makeup held late to anatomically correct body deformations with volume preservation this is more or less the same with the skin slide and muscle simulation i'm talking about the elbows and knees and the pelvis joints if there is no uh, volume preservation the bent arm will look completely broken and you probably noticed this more than one time in different games especially with the real-time sol solutions and at home uh, 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 reducing the number of small contrast and details in the textures of critical areas for example cheekbones zone this is very important zone here between the eyes and the mouth uh if you have like a, i don't know sunspots on this on the skin uh, or maybe some spots or uh, some highly detailed textures or maybe folds or maybe something like this on these areas and if you don't have the proper facial rig that uh, deforms these areas in a realistic way you will have a lot of troubles because the face will look paralyzed because the the static zones between the eyes and the and the mouth uh, something very noticeable and if you have the contrasting texture parts on this zone you will create attention to these zones for the viewer and the viewer will point to these zones and will have the same uncanny valley so just take a look at the uh, the pixar movies uh, they all have like pretty blonde zones without any texture details. They are they they are actually the, the, the shading, the details in the in the textures, but there are no 
accent on these zones at all because they don't have proper uh, human-like deformations in these zones and they're hiding this problem. This problem not because they're bad at something, but because they don't have, um, even the Big Sur doesn't have much resources needed to recreate life like you know, to 100%. Reducing the number, uh, say that, uh, avoiding the hyperrealism in general, make this uh, the I don't know ca character appearance a bit stylized, a bit not human in terms of the I don't know proportions, the scale, the the way how they look. Gears of War is a pretty good example. Uh, there are pretty detailed everything uh, they have lots of mocap they have lots of everything but they're not 100 percent realistic in terms of the proportions in terms of of the of the uh, I don't know, armor all that stuff uh, the mortal combat in other hand the same situation they have pretty close to the uh, the real human anatomy in terms of the silhouette everything but they're very stylized still very stylized and this helps to sell the idea to the brain that this looks cool because there is no uh, too noticeable and kind of violent effect getting rid of, of unnecessary details that make it clear to the brain that it's being fooled uh, i'm talking about this all the time so how to fight and kind of value in animation in character animation body part uh, pay close attention to fingers I explained this before add variations and unevenness uh, to anime cycles this is very important thing if you're working with the animation cycles for the locomotion for whatever if you have just the cycle walk cycle with two steps that looks exactly the same you the, the gamer or viewer will have uh, clear view that this is a robot because robots moves like on a certain in a certain way uh, like they're copy pose and if you add more variations inside the cycles and if, even more if, if the game engine uh, makes it possible to have like a two three four different walk cycles that have like small small bits here and there uh, to not to look exactly the same with the small differences inside the cycles it will greatly improve the appearance of the animation because the black box will see that this walk cycle is not too cycled because there is variation uh, for per first person animation it's very important to show the weight of the objects uh, that the character interact with, uh, the grip, the contacts, the contact points, the shift of the grip uh, that I told, uh, said before. Uh, getting rid of mock-up artifacts is very important. Uh, keeping the uh, actual animation intact is very important too. So basically it's two different things that you need to to keep the balance between the artificial uh, artifacts uh, i don't know the jitter noise that causing by the uh, mocha hardware and the actual natural noise noise of the everything the inevitance the not to ideal arcs and everything so getting rid of keyframe artifacts the same thing I told this before. Uh, anatomically correct animation and facial expressions. It's uh, always a good thing, even if you have very, very stylized characters. Uh, the, if you're doing in a proper way in terms of anatomy, it would look better. Even if you're exaggerating something, you need to exaggerate something. And this something is anatomically correct animation and anatomically correct movement of the body parts and the whole body in general. Mocha protection with anatomically correct and balanced poses. This is very important too when you're retargeting the animation from uh, actor to the character. You need to keep an eye on the balance in terms of the silhouette. It's very important. 
Oh, I'm done. If you have any questions, <laughs> you can ask them.